Now that we are done talking about how insulin and glucagon controls the blood glucose concentration, we want to talk a little bit about measuring the glucose concentration in the urine. All right. Now you might be thinking, why in the world would we want to know if the urine contains glucose or not? And there is a reason for that, by the way, okay? Because under normal circumstances, if you can see here, I'm just drawing out the kidneys uh, and uh, the ureter and also the bladder. For a healthy person, the urine must not contain any glucose. Why shouldn't the urine contain any glucose? The reason why the urine must not contain glucose is there will be in the PCT, all the glucose and all the amino acids should be reabsorbed. So in the urine, there should not be any more glucose left. All right. For the person who has diabetes, however, usually type 2 diabetes or type 1 diabetes for that matter, the blood glucose concentration is usually higher than normal. The reason might be because they cannot produce insulin or they cannot produce enough insulin. Right? So the body cannot control the blood glucose concentration, making it higher than normal. And because the blood glucose concentration is higher than normal, what may happen is their urine may actually contain some glucose. Right? So by checking the person's urine, whether it contains glucose or not, we may be able to confirm if the person has diabetes. All right. So a person may go to the hospital and they, the doctors may suspect that they have diabetes. So one of the first tests that the doctors will do is the doctors will test their urine. And if the urine does not contain glucose, for the most part, they are fine. But if the urine contains glucose, they may have diabetes. So that's why we check the urine first. You don't have to remember the reason, but it's just, it is just good to know. All right. So how do we measure or how do we check for the presence of glucose inside the urine? We use something called a test strip. Right, uh, There are many names for this, but uh, for A-level's purpose, we just call it a test strip. A test strip is just basically a paper, a very thin piece of paper, by the way, with a small little pad at the end of it. And the pad will be like a square shape. All right? And how is it supposed to work? Let's talk about it. Uh, let's just give a basic overview of how it's supposed to work. Now, we have two patients who came to the clinic, and we are going to call them patient A and patient B. And we collected the urine from patient A and also patient B. We put them in a cup. So what we just basically do here is we take the test strip and we just dip it into the urine. All right? And when you dip it into the urine, you notice something very interesting. For patient A, there was no color change in the pad, which means to say there is no glucose in the urine. But for patient B, interestingly, look at what happens to the pad color. So I hope uh, some of my students may be colorblind. All right? So I just hope that you can appreciate the fact that the color has changed over there. Uh, the color on the left is like a lighter green color. You don't have to memorize that. But the color on the right is like a darker brown color. So I'm just trying to imply that the color has changed here, by the way. So if the pad changes color, it means that the glucose is present in the urine. So therefore, patient B might have diabetes. So uh, in this case, what we need to do here is we need to talk a little bit about how does the test strip actually work? And why is it if there's glucose inside the urine, the color of the pad will change color, right? So uh, let's talk about the pad a little bit. So in the pad, the pad itself contains immobilized enzymes, enzymes put in a fixed position. And you must remember the name of the two enzymes, by the way, this is like, this is not up for debate, you have to memorize it. And the name of the two enzymes are glucose oxidase and peroxidase. All right. Now you must know that the function of glucose oxidase is as follows. Glucose oxidase will catalyze the chemical reaction where it takes glucose and oxygen, the substrate, and it will convert it into something called gluconic acid and hydrogen peroxide. All right. This is what it's supposed to do. It will, for the most part, it oxidizes the glucose into gluconic acid. Peroxidase, however, is another enzyme that catalyzes the breakdown of hydrogen peroxide into water and oxygen gas. It's, it is as simple as that. All right. It, that is just the two reactions that you have to know. Also in the pad, there is something called a colorless chemical. The name of the colorless chemical is called a chromogen. Now, if hydrogen peroxide is present, 
what may happen here is the peroxidase will react with hydrogen peroxide and it releases it becomes water and oxygen as i've mentioned earlier but the oxygen will react with the chromogen and when oxygen reacts with the chromogen it becomes oxidized chromogen i know we are doing a bit of chemistry here which is ugh, disgusting but yeah you know we have no choice so um um, and the chromogen becomes oxidized. Remember, the chromogen was colorless, but the moment it receives more oxygen, it becomes oxidized, and that's when we don't have to care about the water, but the oxidized chromogen becomes colored. So that is why for patient B, that is why for patient B, the chromogen or the pad became a colored, a different color because that patient had glucose in their urine. The glucose reacted with glucose oxidase to form gluconic acid and hydrogen peroxide. And the hydrogen peroxide reacted with peroxidase to form oxygen. And the oxygen reacted with the chromogen to become colored. If it sounds very confusing, let's try to do this as simply as possible. Okay, I'm going to draw out the pad. I know I'm going to simplify the pad. And now I'm going to represent the three things on the pad. Glucose oxidase, which have represented as pacments, peroxidase, which are enzymes, which have represented as in a specific active site, and the chromogen. Look at the color of the chromogen. It is colorless right now. All right. Now, in the patient's urine, represented in yellow, right, the patient, let's say this patient was patient B, and they had glucose inside their urine. So the glucose have represented in that red triangle. What will happen to the glucose, by the way? Look at the shape of the glucose. The glucose will react with glucose oxidase. And what does it form? Yes, go back to the equation. It will form something called gluconic acid and hydrogen peroxide. The gluconic acid I've represented in the purple circles and the hydrogen peroxide in those green colored things. Now, notice the shape of the hydrogen peroxide and peroxidase. They are complementary, which means to say hydrogen peroxide in this case will react with the peroxidase. And when the hydrogen peroxide reacts with the peroxidase, what happens? Look at the equation at the top there, okay? It will bind to the peroxidase and it will be broken down into something called water and oxygen. And I told you, look at that equation. What does the oxygen do? The oxygen is the one that goes and reacts with the chromogen. And when it reacts with the chromogen, the chromogen becomes oxidized and it becomes colored. That's how you know that the patient has glucose in their urine. So this is a pretty interesting process or test to actually measure the glucose in the urine. Now, I want you to note something though. This is a semi-quantitative test. Now, what does it mean by a semi-quantitative test? It gives us Quantitative means it gives us a measurable value, which means numbers. But semi means, in this case, it's not numerical or it's not numbered. What do I mean by that is as follows. Let's say there are four patients, patients A, B, C, and D. So each patient had a different color in their pad, right? Patient B had a slight dark color, C has a darker color, and D has an even darker color. So the darker color implies that there is a higher glucose concentration in the urine. But the question is, how high is it, right? So we don't, that is what is meant as semi-quantitative. It tells us whether it's low, medium, or high, but it doesn't tell us how high is it or how low is it. That's what is meant as semi-quantitative. Some test strips will come with a guide, okay, as you can see over here where if it's negative, it's like that yellow color. If it's 100, if it's like a light green color, it's 100 milligrams per deciliter. Um, don't have to memorize that value. And if it's very dark green, it's 3,000 milligrams per deciliter of glucose inside the urine, which means it's extremely high. Now, let's say if the patient gets that particular color, it doesn't mean it's 1,000. It could be 1,800. We don't know for sure. It could be uh, 2,200 milligrams, milligrams per deciliter. Sometimes just gauging it on the color may not be good enough. So it gives you a possible range, but it doesn't tell you specifically how high the glucose concentration is inside the patient's urine. Okay, that is what is meant as semi-quantitative. And another very important thing is you are measuring the patient's urine. You are not measuring the patient's blood. So it's not going to actually tell you what's going on inside the blood, by the way. All right. So if you want a more accurate reading of the patient's 
glucose concentration, we actually look at the blood glucose concentration. And how do we measure the blood glucose concentration? We will see that in the next video.